today on Nurse Talk. Dr. Victoria Sweet, author of the best-selling book, God's Hotel. Healthcare reporter Donna Smith talks about a $700 saw blade. Health and fitness expert Joni Greggins says laughter really is the best medicine. And the Spa Cafe serves a delicious bone soup. All this and more on Nurse Talk. Welcome to Nurse Talk, I'm Casey Hobbs. And I'm Joni Gregans filling in for Shane Mason. And guess what, I join Casey and the millions of nurses out there who wear their stethoscopes every single day at work. Thank you, Joni. Of course, we're referring to the recent comments made on the television show, The View. They talked about the Miss America pageant nurse who did a monologue wearing her scrubs and her stethoscope. Let's watch. Yeah. But then there was a girl who um, wrote her own monologue, which I was like, turn the volume up. Like, this is going to be amazing. Like, let's listen. And she came out in a nurse's uniform and basically read her emails out loud. And shockingly did not win. I was like, that's not a real... Seriously? I swear to God. Why does she have a doctor's stethoscope around Was it about her? that? She helps patients with Alzheimer's, which I know is not funny, but I swear you have to see it. Like, Google it if you can. The View and Company made a feeble attempt at an apology. Let's take a look about um, the Miss America pageant and we were talking about the talent competition and one of the girls Miss Colorado gorgeous girl she got up and gave a monologue and we were talking about the talents it, things I just want to say first of all before we even go on because people were very upset with what we said I for all of us want to say we love nurses if nurses if you're watching we adore you we respect you clap for the nurses really you guys are wonderful you're the most compassionate people and I think you know it's I think we just have to have a moment about that I was not talking about her as a nurse we were talking about the talent competition and it got Misconstrued. So there was an example where I think people kind of, you know, Joy, uh, you know, and not it's a classic example of what we're talking about. Right. Right. And I think that, by the way, if your bosses are watching, uh, you all deserve raises. I want that. This is how much I love nurses. Give them more money. Give them everything. Take my money. Okay. Nurses, we're at their mercy. Let's face yes, it. But, but, you know, but have, you, did, you didn't but, come for nurses, no, though. No. Did they hear the conversation? The did they know that, what you were talking listen, about at all? Let me speak for myself. Right, yeah. Apparently, I did. You know what? I was just not paying attention. I, I was looking at a Miss America tape mm. and there's a woman wearing like out an outfit with Scrubs. a stethoscope and i'm thinking is she in the costume i didn't know she was a nurse the moral of the story is don't mess with nurses because what you do to one you do to all and someday you're going to need a nurse joy good luck this segment was made possible by national nurses united the nation's largest nurses organization with over 190,000 nurses Imagine, if you can, a world without nurses. A healthcare system so debilitated, it's unrecognizable. When nurses disappear, so does patient safety. If you've ever been a patient, or if you'll be one in the future, insist on safe nurse staffing levels. Because it's our registered nurses who put the care in healthcare. Donna Smith, great to have you with us today. Let's get right to this. It's open enrollment season. For those of you in Oklahoma, though, that has nothing to do with hunting season. Huh. Just saying that because Shane's not here. I feel i got to make a shout out to Oklahoma. <laughs> and no Okie jokes? <laughs> well, I thought that was a bad enough one. Oh, we yeah. mean health insurance, and that covers Medicare, Obamacare, PPOs, HMOs, and all of the rest. So, Donna, let's start with Medicare. What's open enrollment, and when does it start? Okay, open enrollment for Medicare is going to begin on October 15th and run all the way through December 7th. So that's for anybody who's already on Medicare and who wants to make any changes to the Medicare drug coverage or they want to make any changes to Medigap coverage or to a Medicare Advantage plan. You don't have to do anything. If you want to just stay in, stay in what you're in right now, you don't have to do a darn thing. Just leave it alone. If you want to make any changes, though, you need to do that during that period. Okay, so you can make changes to any of your plans in that period. Now, what if you decide you want to switch your whole plan? Can you do that at that yes, time? You can, yes, you can do that, but you have to wait until that open enrollment period. You'll probably get plenty of literature in the mail. Most of us who uh, are of the age, of, of a Medicare age, are going to get lots of ads from people who want to 
carrier coverage. So you'll see your mailbox start filling up with that stuff and you can look at it and read it. But remember, it is advertising. You have to be smart enough to look at those plans and decide if it really matches what it is you need. The Medicare.gov site has a really wonderful section where you can even plug in the medications that you take and see under which plan at which premium level you will fare best with your pharmacy needs too. Now you did mention Medigap. Say, talk about Medigap and what it is. Okay, there's a difference between a Medigap plan or it's also sometimes called a Medicare supplemental plan. And it, it's, it is just what it sounds like. It, it allows you to get coverage for any of those deductibles or payments that Medicare doesn't cover. A Medicare Advantage plan is a little bit different. It's like enrolling in a PPO or an HMO that is Medicare based. So the company, it's actually through a private insurance company. They will determine where you get to go, who you get to see. A Medigap plan is not that way. A Medigap pays supplemental coverage for you and you still get to choose wherever it is you want to go with your Medicare coverage. That's great. So now Donna, remind people who are just turning 64 what they need to do to enroll in Medicare. Okay, this is, it's, you, it's also very simple, but you have the three months prior to your birthday month when you will turn 65, and the three months after your birthday month, so you have seven months total. That's now, who nice. came up with that delightful time period? I have no idea, or for what reason, but so for me, for instance, I'm a November baby, so I would be able to start August, September, October, November and then the three months afterwards to take a look. So when I'm 64, you can bet I'm gonna be waiting for August to hit so I can go ahead and get on and enroll. And then you would actually, uh, your Medicare coverage would take effect on your birthday of your 65th birthday. That's great. So now what about fines for not having insurance under Obamacare? When is that gonna kick in? Well, that, that has already kicked in for people who don't have cover, didn't have coverage in 2014 or 2015 that in 2015, the, the penalty was 2% of your income, Yikes. or there was a maximum of $900 per family, whichever was greater. So for some people, that can be a substantial amount of money if you didn't in, have insurance. Once we get into 2016, that starts to go up higher. It'll be 2.5% of your income, or the cover for a family, it'll go up to almost $1,000 for a penalty if you don't sign up for insurance. So some people are making that choice that it's just cheaper to pay the penalty or or makes more sense to them for some reason. For me, that doesn't make sense. There's too much risk involved for me with, with previous health problems and so forth. I'm not going to risk that. But there are other people who don't have health problems who make that decision. Not wise, in my opinion. Okay, so we have about three minutes left. What else would you like to tell uh, healthcare consumers out there? Uh, anything about hospital billing? Absolutely. Here's an important thing for all of us that we that I didn't used to do as frequently as I do it now. Asking for an itemized bill when you get health care services or when you're hospitalized is a critical part of being a patient in this system. It's not only important because it's just right to know whether you're getting everything that, that you're being billed for, but it's one way to create better transparency so we can all see what we're gonna be charged for. I give an example sometimes. I had a knee replacement done 10 years ago and I got the bill and I got an itemized bill and I took it, there was a saw blade on it that cost $700. Wow. So just for fun, I called up the billing office and I said, I'd like to have the blade. And they asked me, they said, <laughs> That's they said great. Uh, well, we can't really do that. I said, well, if you I'm paid. paying for the blade, and I said, it must be quite a saw blade. For Maybe 700 we could bucks. Use it for Thanksgiving dinner or something oh, along those lines. Brilliant, Donna. That is brilliant. <laughs> and did they practically die on that yeah, one? Yes. The woman started laughing and she said, well, she said, quite honestly, I don't think we can give you the blade. I said, well, then I don't think you should charge me if you're going to clean it up and use it again. Which or you know they are going to clean it up and use it again. Of course they are. Of course they are. So, you know, just spotting those kinds of things and, and calling them to task, 
The other thing that's really interesting for people to know is that every hospital has what's called a charge master. It's a list that they maintain behind the scenes of all the charges for every little nitty gritty thing that they provide for you. And on that charge master, it also is so interesting because it'll list the difference between what I, for instance, might pay, what you might pay with your insurance contract, what others might pay. Fascinating to take a look at those charge masters and find out that so much of what's done has little basis in reality in terms of charging. It just ha may happen that your insurance company was aggressively better at negotiating a price for something than another insurance company might be. So Donna, it's always a pleasure. Uh, for more information on these topics, you can visit ssa.gov slash medicare slash or healthcare.gov or nursetalksite.com. Always a pleasure, Donna. Thank you so much. You know so much. You're not even working off a script or anything. This is just, uh, you live and breathe this, and we really appreciate your knowledge. Absolutely. Thank you all, and take care of those Okies out there. <laughs> Thank you in the Mile High State. We appreciate it. Check out the rest of Donna Smith's health care report at nursetalksite.com. Nurse Talk is also broadcast weekly on the Progressive Voices TuneIn Network. Check it out at nursetalksite.com. And now, health and fitness expert, Joni Greggins. Today's segment is about laughter. I'm gonna tell you 10 things you may not know about laughter. For example, Casey, number one, rats laugh when they're tickled. Serious. I kid you not. And the more they play together, the more they laugh. By rats, do you mean Republicans? Uh, well, it depends. Have you tickled any? This was discovered in the 1990s when a psychologist first observed laughing rats. Special equipment was needed, okay, to hear them because rats have a very high pitch. I want that equipment and I want to get some rats. I would love to know how so, he discovered that. Think about rats, bad he rats, right? He was in right? a quiet room with yes, a rat. Yes, with a rat, laughter. Really loud <laughs> acoustic material, okay. All right. What's the next one? Two, you're more likely to laugh around others. That Not necessarily sense. because of a joke, but because you're around other people. Uh, most people, uh, find that when they're interacting with others, if something's funny, it's funny. In fact, they found there's interaction with others 30% of the time. When you laugh alone, it's very rare. You ever notice when you see someone laughing by themselves walking down the street, you think, Usually hmm. they're crazy. Now you know why. We laugh in groups, you see. So get yourself a group. Now your brain can detect fake laughter. And you have noticed that, pardon me, fake laughter. You've noticed that, haven't you? Someone says, yeah, oh, canned yeah, laughter on TV. Yes. I definitely know the yeah. difference between the real McCoy or the canned. You know, when you think about it, that went on for years. Think and about it. Was, it. Huh? And it didn't make you laugh, really, No, the canned. It, you know, that, we should have been part of that study. Anyway, your brain knows between real or staged laughter. When you hear staged or deliberately staged laughter, more activities in the prefrontal lobe of the brain. That helps you understand other people's emotions. So, got that? So, I mean, you can't fool Mother Nature or your brain. So we know a fake is a fake. Four, laughter's contagious. You know the saying, laugh and the whole world laughs with you. Well, it's more than an expression. Laughter's really contagious. The sound of laughter triggers, again, your brain. Listen to this. All the thing, parts of your brain that's responsible for moving parts of your face it gets in gear. So the muscles correspond with you laughing. Sort of like the brain is puppet master. Think about that. So if I'm seeing you laugh, uh -huh. then it responds, my brain responds right. with the muscles in my face and then to you, automatically then you start go, in a smile. Up at the corners. Or, yeah. Makes sense. Exactly. Makes sense. Uh, five, familiarity is a key part of humor. Research shows that people laugh more at comedians they know. They really laugh. Yes, because you're already primed. You yes. know that pre one, your your muscles are wired. Yes. You see them, oh, they're a funny person already. I'm getting that smile Back going. Back to on. three, you're right. Yes. Where if someone's just starting out telling the same jokes, not so, not so funny. I don't I know if you're a comedian out there, you need to know that. So don't feel bad. Just keep going for it. Eventually right. you'll either make it or not, right? Uh, six, laughter raises both your energy expenditure and heart rate by about ten to twenty percent. Now, yes. this means you could burn about 10 to 40 calories by laughing for 10 to 15 minutes. But wait, you'd have to laugh for a solid hour. Got oh, that? Or more. For, that would be kind of hard. Yeah, for all the effects. And think about, go back to number two, you know, how we react when you see a person laughing by themselves. Think about watching someone laughing for 60 minutes. Wow. Not good. I think probably better ways of burning calories. Seven, laughing is good for your relationship. Research shows that couples who use laughter 
and smile when discussing very touchy subjects. You know, they feel better. They report they have a better so relationship. So much easier. I use laughter on the job for that very reason. Yes. If I have really difficult news for a patient or something hard to talk about, joking really helps ease it up. It does. Yeah. It absolutely does. And nine, laughter is attractive. Studies That's found that true. women looking for a mate were 62% more likely to mention laughter, seeking a mate with a sense of humor. Absolutely. Now men, Key. men were more likely to offer humor in their ads. They preferred to be the one, you know, I'm in charge of humor here and the laughter. So they don't say, looking for a woman that likes to laugh, they're going to be funny. And 10, laughter has lots of health benefits. It's good for your memory enhances immunity, improves sleep, improves blood pressure, enhances oxygen intake, releases your body's natural defenses, which are your endorphins, and enhances creativity and memory, just to name a few. And you didn't name the most important one, I which think. Which is? Laughter is good for your bowels. It relaxes them. I think it that's It helps with constipation. It really does. I know. I've read this literature. It does. So you sit it's on the toilet and laugh? Laughing in your life eases it up, so if you're a right. constipated person, laugh more. I like that. So if you hear someone laughing... And, and you can tell those constipated people are people who don't laugh a lot. And don't we always... And you wonder if there's a good correlation between those two. And don't we say that person looks constipated? We've all Exactly. Done that. Well, now we know. They That's are. That's it. <laughs> anyway. And all you need to do is give them a good joke. I tell you, I learned so much here. Any wonder that we at Nurse Talk say, laughter is the best medicine. Thank you, Johnny. That you're was welcome. great. <laughs> Today on Nurse Talk, Dr. Victoria Sweet, author of the best-selling book, God's Hotel. Dr. Sweet is here with us today to talk about her book and her experiences in it. Dr. Sweet, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thanks so much for having me, Casey. It's a pleasure. And I have to say, I always feel compelled to say, when I first, to somebody, your, when your book first came out and it uh, made the, the Chronicle, and a friend of mine called me, a nurse friend, and said, oh, there's this really good book I think you're going to like, God's Hotel. And of course, mm. for some reason, I thought she was, it was written by a nurse. So I get the book, and I pick it up, I open it up, and I'm like, oh, crap, it's written by a doctor. I don't know if I want to read it. And I read it and I was delighted by it because, you know, for some reason I thought it was going to be more, given that it was written by a physician, more um, like a text, more like a medical text. And it was such a great story. I just was fascinated. Well, you know, I got totally interested in the whole nursing part of it. And I think that's probably also what you responded to. This is what I responded to after a while. So, you know, I didn't pay, I didn't really understand, um, I'll call it the nursing part of medicine until I was there for quite a while. And I began to get this sort of to understand that in a lot of ways what the nurses did was more important than what the doctors did actually in that setting, mm -hmm. which was and is a long-term care setting, i.e. a place where people are there for more than a day or two or three, sometimes two weeks, sometimes two months, sometimes years and years and years. And even the patients themselves will tell you if you ask them. I've had them tell me, you know, Doc, <coughs> the nurses, who I have for my nurse is way more important. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. And then, And then as you know from the book, I ended up, after several years, really getting interested in Florence Nightingale, who I had the opposite feeling of. So you were like, oh, Doc wrote this book. And then I was like, Florence Nightingale, oh yeah, the patron saint of nurses. You yes. Know, like dippy, zippy, you know, pablum, you know, the wife to the husband doctor. And then once you read Florence Nightingale, I was just taken by her. Well, what I loved about the book is when you got into going on the pilgrimage and learning about, uh, is it 16th century it's Hildegard? It's 12th century. 12th century Hildegard, which was brilliant. And what I loved was the plant model versus the mechanical model. Because so Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, well, one of the big things is that I'd actually been a doc for quite a few years before I got to Laguna Honda. So, and I, I, you know, I, I loved medicine and what the, the, the method of modern medicine. But I gradually, after being a doc for quite a few years, I began to realize that my patients, that there was some other different way of looking at the body that I was missing. So I discovered Hildegard of Bingen, who was this 12th century nun, abbess, mystic, some of, some of the, uh, your um, 
people watching the show probably know her from her music, which uh, is now being played after a thousand years. She did Gregorian chants. She did incredible theological pieces, but she'd also written a book on her medicine. So I discovered this book. It had just been translated from Latin into German and German into English, and I'm reading it going, this is amazing because it was not the, uh, I call it the eye of newt, toe of frog medicine I expected from a medieval medical book. Yes. Hildegard was describing a real medicine for real patients with real diseases that I could recognize. But I could tell it was based, her idea of the body was based on a completely different idea from our mechanical model of the body. The body is a machine and the doctor is a mechanic. And the idea in our model is the doc's supposed to get in there, find what's broken, and fix it. And that's a great model, especially if you're acutely ill. But behind Hildegard's book was this different model. So I ended up going back to school and doing a PhD in uh, medical history. And Hildegard was my focus. But I didn't want to stop practicing medicine. And that's how I got to this wild hospital in San Francisco I'd never seen, called Laguna Honda Hospital in San Francisco which looked like a medieval monastery as it turned out. Boy, it sure does look like that, did it, look like that. It had 1,200 patients when I showed up. It had a staff of 1,600, and it looked like a medieval monastery. It had red tiled roof and um, a bell tower and turrets and a live-in priest, a nun, and it's run by the city of San Francisco, mind you. It and had a, a church. farm. It had a farm. It had a church. You know, a, like a real church, not like a like quiet, a chapel, not right. like a quiet place. You know, a meditation place. No, it was a church with with stained glass windows and uh, polished wooden pews, and uh, very politically incorrect stations of the cross along wow. the walls. And when you walked in, okay, when you walk in the back way, which is of course how everybody actually would get there, seeing so, you know, yes. as a hospital, you know, the ambulance building up, people going in above. Up there, you'd have to actually look to see it, was this gorgeous wooden statue of St. Francis. Hmm. And so was it built, did it have a religious theme to it when it was first built? Well, you know, all of medicine and nursing has a religious theme yes. to it. And we can't get away from that. And that's the part that's missing in our current way that's being forced down us of looking at medicine as if it were healthcare. Yes. A commodity that some doctor is going to take off the shelf and sell to you for this, you know, provide you for the cheapest possible price. And nurses, even worse. In even ways. worse. Even worse. For part two of Casey's interview with Dr. Victoria Sweet, go to nursetalksite.com. Let Casey try it. The Spa Cafe. Here we are at the Spa Cafe, and today we have something delicious for you, nutritious. It's called bone broth, huh, Casey? Now, I have to say, Joni, I yes. love your presentations. Thank so you. it was the glass last time, and this is a lovely, looks like a uh, um, well, Chinese brought it type in. bowl. So, it's yeah, beautiful. Isn't it great? So let's give it a taste. Mmm. Oh, I think that's, do you like that? Very it's delicious. It's it is so light, so delicious. You know, I already feel it is very energized. Light. Don't mm -hmm. you think? And it's just full of great ingredients and things Ooh, like that. That's very Would well, you like actually. that? Actually, I do you know, like that. Actually, you're eating that an awful, I mean, lots and lots. This mm -hmm. is vegetables. It oh, has. Don't tell oh, me that part. You, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. It has parsley. It has filtered water. It has meaty bones, such as short ribs. And is this really good for you? It is so good for you. It's full of vitamins and minerals. And again, because of the bone marrow or the beef marrow that we're using here and the knuckle bones, do you like that? Mm. All of these See, ingredients. See the knuckle bones, really you got to put in the knuckle bones because well, it has some good stuff isn't in it, it, I the guess. Knee bone? Okay. No, again, having, you can use beef short ribs as we said, raw apple cider vinegar, water, Wonderful. Now you're going to cook it in the crock pot for 20 hours. Now see, that's the part, 20 hours. So you just set it all up yes. in the crock pot and go away. Yeah, and then put a timer, of course, so you know it doesn't go too long. But the thing is, all of these nutrients... It's, it's damn good. Look at this is amazing. I all say. of the nutrients come out of the foods that are cooked and cooked. And then you can either keep it in the fridge for five to seven days. And again, remember we talked about the three o'clock 
break. This Bring would be it in great a thermos. at a three o'clock break. Don't you think? Because it's tasty and it's good and it's kind of light. So yes. you're not going to get too heavy and that groggy after the three o'clock if you eat something too heavy. Exactly. When you're more tired. This is quite delicious. Oh, you can freeze it up if to you're six not months. Years, I'll eat it. Oh, you're not touching <laughs> this. Anyway, <laughs> or you can freeze it for up to six months. So, you know, put it out. Again, warm some of it. Put some of your vegetables or things that you're cooking. But this is a winner. Now, do you ever use this over something, like as a little, you know, to pour it over? Like, the, well, uh, you know, I don't know why you couldn't. You can do, it is your bone it's, broth. It's tasty. You can it do it whatever you want. like a gravy on some mashed potatoes. Oh, like a light, chicken. oh, I like that. Bone broth with potatoes. Mm. Hey, not bad. Yeah. What can I say? Anyway, this is a winner. Would you not agree? I think this is a winner. Easy to do and nutritious. Thanks. That's it for Spa Cafe. Thank you, Joni. You're welcome. It's time for Street Smarts. Just how smart are we? Now it's time to find out how smart people are. Where in the world is Nancy Longo? Hi, guys. I thought I'd get you one of the best shots of the Golden Gate Bridge for today's question. And that is... What part of your body comes out to play at night? Um, your reproductive organs. <laughs> uh, everything below my waist. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. Um, it's a body part. A body part? Uh, my tail. Okay, and we'll give you one last try. Okay. Not your tail and nothing below the waist. Okay, my uh, arm. What part of your body comes out to play at night? Wow, um, I can think of a f <laughs> penis. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a second chance. You're wrong. Go ahead. Uh, what comes out at night to play? A part of my body. Um, I, gosh, I'm going to, I mean, the only th your tongue. It appears a lot of things come out to play at night, according to these people. Well, let's get back to the studio for the real answer. Thanks, Nancy. Here's the right answer. Well, that's it for this week's edition of Nurse Talk. Visit us at nursetalksite.com.